Hi, I'm Mike Mahoney. I'm a professional wood turner. I'd like to say thank you for viewing my DVD on how I go about making hollow forms. Hollow forms have been of great intrigue to me over the years, and it's one of the first projects that got me heavily involved into wood turning. And I actually have my first hollow form here still, 22 years later. I recall being very smitten with this piece, even though it's pretty brutal compared to the items that I'm doing today. And it's actually even worse if you actually got to see the inside. I only had a gouge to accomplish this job, so I didn't do that bad. But good to have a piece like this to see how things have progressed over the years. Today I want to show you all the tools that we have at our disposal and how they work. And the process from top to bottom. When we make a hollow form, we want to make really nice consistent wall thicknesses, gradually getting a little heavier here at the bottom to give our piece a little bit of gravity when we put them down. That's going to take a little practice and perseverance on your part. Later on in the DVD, there'll be an opportunity for you to view how I make burial urns. Now, hollow forms lend themselves to be great burial urns as long as you can attach a lid to them. And I'll show you the process of how I do it. You're also going to be interested in how big the container needs to be for the ashes that are going inside, and I'll explain that as well. Then we'll be making a little miniature hollow form like this. I love to introduce these into a classroom situation because if you have an accident, it isn't a huge tragedy. Now we're going to discuss the form, the focal point, and the whole process from top to bottom on these as well as the others. Let's go out to the studio and make that happen. Typically in my studio, I'm wearing a respirator with a face shield. As you know, wood turning creates lots of fine particles, and I wouldn't want to be breathing those on a daily basis. Today, I'm just going to wear some safety glasses so I can project my voice better for the camera. Well, for our process of hollowing today, I've chosen this end grain piece of maple. Basically, all I want to do is put it between centers, round it up, put it in the chuck, and then we'll talk about all the hollowing tools that we have at our disposal to make that happen. So let's go do it. To put this piece between center, I've chosen a two-spur prong as compared to a four-spur prong. Typically, two-spur prongs drive in deeper, lessening the chance for it to spin out here. That's why I prefer it. Let's put it between centers now. To round this down, I'm going to use this modified roughing gouge. Let's get to it. A little more speed. There we go. Good and tight. Yep. finish rounding it up, I'm going to use this 5 8 long swept gouge. Long nose, long sweep. First I'll develop the tenon. See a form emerge now. I want to take a closer look at the tenon. Cutting the tenon here is crucial. Basically what I'm doing is I'm leaving a flat spot here to mesh with the chuck. Now I'm gripping on a minimum of 40% of the diameter of my project here. That'll give me a very secure hold. So let's go ahead and cut that in. It's very simple. My gouge here having a very long nose and a long sweep allows that to happen. And roll it right in like so. There we go, nice tenon. Okay, you can see this line stopping right there and it breaks through all the way down to the bottom of the form here. My finished shape is going to be this bottom elevation here, so I'm not going to lose any of the tenon material. 
That's a great thing about a chuck, is it's so economical and ecological. Okay, that's good enough. Let's put it in the chuck. Overemphasizing the point about the tenon here, notice there's no gap between the metal and the wood here. That's key to a good hold. If you have a gap, by all means, recut the tenon to make sure that that doesn't happen. Otherwise, you'll have a failure. Now I'm in the chuck. I'm still going to use my tailstock here as support while I shape. I'm going to use a 3 8 inch spindle gouge here to finish up, cleaning it up. Give myself a nice voluptuous curve here. Nice little coved area right there. That looks good. Okay, now that we have our tailstock removed, I can get to this surface here. I'm going to cut a little V groove to accept the drill bit, and then we'll talk about the whole hollowing process. Okay, now there's a nice little V slot right there. The drill can go right into the dead center without having to go out of round. That's exactly what we want. Let's talk about the process. By cutting this V groove, what I've done is created an area where I'm going to throw my drill bit through the center of the form all the way down to my finished base. If you don't remove that center, it's going to be very difficult to scrape that area because it's spinning very slow. Now, Let's look at the process and then we're going to go discuss how many tools that we have at our disposal to make this happen. Now you can see my drill bit hole here. Make sure that you get that accurate because you obviously don't want to go too deep when you drill in your hole there. You might ruin your piece. Err on the side of shortness there. Now as you can see now I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There is no other process that can happen here. You always have to remove bulk from the top down. You have to leave it thick here in order to make cuts up here. Also one other thing to understand is we have to finish our exterior completely and we never go back to it once we start hollowing out the interior form. One more thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take the piece off and cut a portion of this away so you can see the action of the tool while it works. Hopefully that will help you understand the process a little bit more. Let's take a look at all the tools that we can use to make hollow forms. Let's categorize them into cutting tools, scraping tools, and possibly a hybrid that we'd like to look at. Today I'm just going to use my Stewart tool which is a round nose scraper and I can use this hook tool also to get around the corner. That's not to detract from these other tools, I'm just using it because that's what I'm used to. Now the cutting tools are typically a shielded tool and it only allows a certain amount of wood to be cut through the cutter. Now, the beauty of this tool is it cuts the wood clean. Its drawback is, is it has a tendency to pull us into the cut and then we have to react to that pull to create an arc on the interior of the form. You just have to know there's a little bit more of a skill curve to that tool, whereas a scraper will go exactly where we put it. Now, the drawback to a scraper is it leaves behind torn grain possibly depending on the timber. But we can manipulate the scraper at a sheer angle to create a better surface. Now, whatever you choose is your choice. The process is still the same. Let's take a closer look at all these tips and their designs and how they work. Here's a look at our shielded tool. The shielded tool is a variation of a hook tool. And if you've ever used a hook tool, you know how difficult it is to master. This shield has made this tool a lot easier to use because it limits the amount of wood that goes through it. Once you master the skill of using this tool, you can make beautiful interiors 
of your hollow forms because they cut the wood a lot cleaner. This is a Stuart boring bar and it's very typical of many boring bars and scrapers for doing hollow forms. It has a little round nose tip on it, a little machine tip with about a 45 degree bevel to get the chin of the tool out of the way of the cut while you're working. This is a very efficient and easy to use tool. Here's a look at our Stuart scraper here. The hook tool here, the scraping edge is in line with the tool shank. That's important because we won't get any centrifugal force pulling down on the tool as long as our tool rest is from here back. Now again, it's had a little 3 16 inch scraper there, cut back with a bevel about 45 degrees, and that'll do the bulk of our scraping around the corner in our vessel. Here's a look at another Stuart tool with a teardrop scraper on this. This will do all of our finished cuts today. I'm going to leave the tool at a sheer plane to get a cleaner surface. But the beauty of a teardrop is that this area here picks up any high spots in the vessel and leaves behind a nice, flat, clean surface behind. This will give us a nice, smooth, consistent wall thickness today. Here's another tool we'll be using today. This is a Jordan design tool, very similar to the Stuart tools that I showed you earlier. It's very nice because it's compact and it does a little smaller vessel um, like the one we'll be doing today. Again, the hook tool has to be used with the tool rest behind the curve. And again, a good design hook tool has its cutter in line with its tool shank. Another tool we'll be using today is this McNaughton scraper, and you can see it has a slight little hook here. This is for doing very small hollow forms, similar to the miniature form we'll be doing. Again, it's just a little round nose scraper here that's going to do the bulk of all of our scraping. Here's another hollowing tool I'd like to cover. This is the Ellsworth design tool, and it's a little bit more difficult to use, but it's an excellent tool once you master it. Since the cutter is off to the left here, it has a tendency to pull a little bit on you, but again, in the right hands, you can do wonderful work with this tool. Here's a look at the hybrid tool I was telling you about. The tip here is what's important. It's on a hook tool. Now, the metal here is made out of a microcarbide that is razor sharp and stays razor sharp well past high speed type of steels. Now, it works similar to a scraper, but it leaves behind a much fresher surface. I believe that a lot of our hollowing tools will be going to tips like this to get cleaner surfaces. This is by no means all the tools that we have out there for hollow forms, but it'll give you a good idea of how they basically all work. There's one other contraption that I'd like to show you before we start the hollowing process, and it's on the other side of the studio here. Let's go take a look. This is a captured hollowing system, and it's very novel. Basically, the tool is held horizontally between these two bars, and it takes away all the force that you would normally get as if you were holding this tool manually. I would resort to this tool if I had something really deep to hollow, or I had some wrist weakness. Now, there's other contraptions you can hook up to this tool, a laser beam to basically measure your wall thicknesses. It almost gets on the verge of cheating. However, there's really no substitute than doing this manually. You'll get a much nicer feel when you hold the tool by yourself. And if you have some patience, there's no reason why you can't gauge your wall thicknesses evenly if you take time to check. Let me show you the process that I do. Let's head over to the other leg. Well, you can see I've cut a portion out of our hollow form. Hopefully that's going to help us view the interior of the form. Makes my hollowing a little bit more difficult, I know that. But it should be okay. Let's drive a drill bit through the inside there and get our finished depth. Just going to get a little starter hole here to start, and then I'll measure. I've got fairly good depth there. A little bit more, and then I'll measure. Okay, I think I'm going to go try for this depth, there we go, right there, my thumb marks the spot. About a quarter inch more and I'll have it. Be careful with this operation, you don't want to go too deep. Now, you notice my 
drill bit has a very large handle for security. You can also drive a hole in with a Jacobs chuck on your, your tool rat or your tail center, and that would be fine. Okay, we're going to hollow out now. Things to consider when we drive in there. The scraper that I'm using here has to be worked on a downhill plunge. That's the key. This is also ingrain fiber, so I'd like to work from the inside out, inside out. There'll be times when I cut from the outside in, but I'm cutting a lot lighter going that way because the wood doesn't like to be cut that way. Let's go ahead and start. right now. I'm sticking the tip of the tool into the drill hole right there and then sweeping to the left. Very deliberate cut, very steady, pulling chips out as I go. You can see the wood starting to fight me because I'm fairly deep into the form. This requires a lighter touch. Now, I know I'm at the bottom when I push the nose of the tool into the dead center and it no longer cuts. That tells me I'm at the bottom. Not there yet. All right, I think I'm right there. Let me feel it. Yep, there it is. Right to the bottom. Pull some chips out. I'm going to open it up just a bit. Hopefully it will break out soon. There we go. Just broke out a bit. That's going to make it easy to get the chips out. Now, let's look on the chart and see where we are. Basically what I've done here is I've scraped one, two, three, and four. The drawing doesn't show it, but of course I've got a lot more mass down here where my chuck is. Uh, I'm really thick here, of course, uh, but I have tapered it like that. Now I'm going to start working at five, six, and seven, and then we'll check our progress. Okay, let's open her up now, just a bit. Top to bottom. working farther down inside the vessel. Okay, let's stop and look at our progress. All right. Excellent. Now it's going to be broken out there a little bit because of the grain. We'll have to look on this side. Now you can see, a little bump there, uh, can't really get to that area with the straight tool. That's when I elect to go to the hook tool. We're almost onto that hook tool now. As you can see, I've left a lot more bulk in this area. It's always more bulky here, and we're thin from the top to the bottom. Now let's go ahead to the hook tool. I've got to move my tool rest back here now to compensate for the hook. The reason I've decided to head to the hook tool now is because the straight bar no longer gets me around the corner. Now a couple of things to note about the hook tool. It's still a scraping tool, so it has to be held on a downhill plunge. And I'm going to kind of twist the tool to the left so it's even further down. Uh, that keeps me from doing any catching. Again, I'm going to have the tool rest from this area back, not into the hook region. Let's go for it. Okay, I'm going to work at the top and get that just right. Okay, I'm working top to bottom. This is the area I do the top first. 
first. I'm not quite at my finished ball pickers. I'm going to let the teardrop scraper do that. thickness here about halfway down. And then we'll take a break and take a look. Again, looking at this side, you can see where I'm going. I've gotten a little thin here as compared to this wall right here. And you can see this big shelf here. I've got to be aware not to hit that with the tool. I'm going to nick it off a little bit on the high spot and work it down. Let's color this surface here so we can see it better. All right, you can see I've kind of darkened our cross section here. I've got a fairly consistent wall thickness coming here. Got a little thin there. I'll rectify that with some more cuts up here. And you can see this shelf that I've got there. I basically have split the bowl in half. I'm going to go a little lower and finish that completely and get that nice and smooth. I want my fingers to get in there and feel around and know that that's nice and smooth before I go further. I need this bulk right there uh, to make cuts up here. So let's go for it. A little bit more here on top. shelf. There it is. shelf considerably and I've thinned our wall here. I think that works out good. Now I'm going to go to the teardrop scraper to smooth this whole surface out up to here. Let's go for it. Okay I've got my teardrop scraper here. A couple other things to elaborate on. When I put the tool in I have to be very conscious of putting it in without hitting the rim. You'll ruin more bowls putting this tool in and taking it out. So be very careful and very deliberate when you put the tool in and when you take it out. Now, other things to consider, the teardrop again is going to pick up the high spots and leave a flat. And I'm going to work from the top to right where I left off here, right here at the middle. Now, let's go a little bit more and then uh, check our progress. Hopefully with a change of light you can see a little better of what's going on inside there. sides and my body makes the cut. Very light cut here. A little bit too much wood, that's all that's 
sound is, a little loose in the handle. Now you can see I've got a nice steady line all the way to about here. Just a slight little ledge right there. Not a problem. Got my fingers in there. I know you wood turners are going to stick your finger in the vessels. You always do. That's got to be smooth just for you. So that feels really good. I'm done up to about right there. And then I'm just going to slightly give myself a little better curve. And then uh, we'll get a little more aggressive with things down here. Careful putting the tool in. Very deliberate with the tool. take a look. Yeah, almost have a decent curve there. A little bit more work to do. Back in. Let's check that. Much better. It's looking really good right there. Now I can go proceed further. A little aggressive cut here. Does not like to cut right at it, so you gotta come up the hill. If you like, you can go right to the boring bar now, but I'm going to stick with the teardrop. Not lazy. Hardest part of the form right there because it's spinning so slow. And you're right into the teeth of the end grain fiber. Okay, let's check that. Now all I've got to do is work from the center out with a nice smooth cut. I'm going to put the tool right at the dead center and work uphill. The way the tool looks like inside is I'm going to have the tool on a downhill plunge and I'm going to tilt the tool at a shear plane. I'm going to find the dead center. I'm going to push hard with my hand here and I'm basically going to move it up very slow up the hill and back off as I get up just a little higher. That's how the action works. Let's do it. Okay, find dead center. There we go. I'm right at it. Sometimes that's difficult to do on the end grain. There it is. Now, up the hill. A very light cut. There we go. Very deliberate. Up the hill. Back it up as I come up the hill and just take a lighter cut. Oh, 
All right, there we go. Let's take a look at that. All right, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I've eliminated all the spirals. I've got a nice curve working right there. Let me show you a nifty little jig to take the bottoms of these hollow forms off. You can do it numerous ways with a vacuum chuck or just a tension drive, just impinging on this surface. This little jig makes a nifty little item out of it. Now, it's basically a mandrel with a number two mortise taper on it, and this cone is homemade, so you can make it any size that you like, and this little face plate slides back and forth depending on the depth of your hollow form. I've already have it set up. I have a little sanding disc here that will impinge on the bottom that will uh, drive it, and now let's put it back together. Snug it up. Get that right into the dead center. I don't want to put a lot of pressure on it, but that's good enough. Now, I can get access to removing the bottom now. There we go. Should run fairly true. Continue the curve. Okay, that looks good. Now I'm just going to undercut the base a bit. As I'm watching the DVD here, I noticed I put a lot of emphasis on the interior and the consistent walls. And that's all well and good, but it's really not telling us the whole story. What we'd really like to do is hollow out a pretty form. And that's not easy to do. And I'm not an authority on design, I just know what works for me. As I show you here on the video, I'm basically making the base smaller than the opening. And this really works for me. I believe it gives the piece a lot more elegance when it finally does sit on the table. And if viewed at the right angle, I like to think that this line continuously flows around the piece and that really dresses up the item. Now, let's scroll ahead here and take a look at our chucking problem here. Now there's our nub and we can't get to that area the way it is. So we're going to take a two inch disc sander and put it on my drill press and I'm going to sand that area away and I'm going to clean that area just as nice as the rest of the vessel and then of course I'm going to sign it and date it. We're not going to have that problem with our miniature hollow forms. We're going to take that area off with our vacuum chuck and make a really nice job of it. It really enhances the value of the turning. Let's get set up to make one of those. I like to introduce these miniature hollow forms in a classroom situation. It's a great way to learn the process and it isn't a huge tragedy if you have an accident. What I like to impart onto the students is form and focal point. In this case, this is a very classic form. It's a form that I make often and it's one that I like to explore. Now, if you like contemporary forms or classic forms, you need to go out and explore those shapes. It's one of the greatest adventures you'll have as a wood turner. Now focal point is the area of the form that is viewed most often and in this case it's the upper portion of the form. Now if I have a piece of wood that has some dazzling timber on one side and maybe just some straight grain on the other, I'm going to manipulate the wood so when the form is finished the dazzling grain is on the top. Well today let's go and make a beautiful little form from top to bottom and we'll critique it. Okay, I picked a beautiful bit of redwood burl here and the best grain is right here on top. 
I put a screw hole there, and that's the easiest way I know how to hold this, since I don't have to do any manipulation this way. This is going to be a superior hold. Screw that on there like that. Snug up the tailstock a bit. There we go. Now we're ready. I'm going to rough it down here with my 5.8 gouge here. Long nose, long sweep, very efficient. Fairly small tenon there. I have to have a chuck that fits that tenon. pretty much the rough shape. I've got a good tenon here. Uh, the wood's real pretty. Just good rough cuts. Now I'm going to put it in the chuck, shape it, and then hollow it. Alright, get that good and tight in the chuck. There we go. No gap in the face between the metal and the wood there. Perfect hole. Now let's shape it up. Still staying with my heavy gouge now. Just going to do some sheer scraping. These aren't really rough cuts, but they're not finished cuts either. Just kind of getting the feel of the shape. A little push cut if I like. You can see the form appearing. For balance, I like to keep the ultimate diameter here about one-third from the top or two-thirds from the bottom. That's a good measurement to go by. Let's form the neck. Okay, I like what I see there, so I'm going to keep it. Now I'm just going to refine it with some cleaner cuts. Now. The base of the piece is going to be smaller than the opening. That will give this piece a little lift. Need a little extra speed here since it's such a small diameter and it's a finished cut. So here's a shear scrape. Clean it all up. Trying to get a continuous curve from here to there, no flat spots. Okay, let's haul that form. That's a nice looking shape. Okay, I'm going to develop a little V cut in here. Little quarter inch spindle gouge. Ok, 
Okay, that'll work. I'm going to slow my speed down, get my toe rest out of the way. A little slower. Okay, let's drill to our bottom. Okay, let's measure. I'm going to go right to the smallest diameter in that cleft region there. That'll be a good spot to start. There's my depth. Right to that point. Pull out. There we go. Now I've got my center out of the way. Okay, I'm going to use a little McNaughton scraper here that has a straight bar here and on the other side of my handle I have a little hook tool so I can, it's a two-in-one. Now I'm going to go straight to the bottom Okay, right now I've already developed my wall thickness. I'm about an eighth of an inch right there. Just a bit. This will let chips fall into that corner. And that'll help me out. Go. Straight down. Okay, open it up just a bit more. Get all the way down to the bottom now. Nose of the tool goes right to the drill hole. Go left. Drill hole, go left. There we go. All the way down to the bottom now. Now I need to open up that way. Same process as the first one. I went straight down in a taper and now I open up. Clean that up. Okay, that's good. Everything looks okay so far. Let's keep moving out. Let's go to the hook tool. So now I can reach around the corner. Got to be careful never to hit the opening with the tool because it'll break the neck if I do. All right, top to bottom. Okay, getting there real close to being finished now. I got to make sure that I never hit the rim while I work. If I'm in here and I rattle around like that, it'll break the rim there because it's awful thin. It's less than an eighth of an inch right there. So be careful. A little more speed. These are almost finished cuts. Going around the corner, matching the interior curve to the exterior we've already cut. Okay, let's clean.
clean out now. Okay, it's getting thin enough now that I have to start measuring. Let's do that. This is an awful large set of calipers, but you can see that I'm about three-eighths of an inch right there on the side. A little heavier there on the bottom. That's exactly what I would expect. There we go. About three-eighths, another quarter inch to go. The more of these you do, the less you have to measure. But when you get like an eighth of an inch here, you've got to constantly stop and check your progress. I'm finishing up the top here. Very deliberate. My hands are locked. And my body makes the cut. in an arc inside the form to match the exterior curve. I'm getting real close. Let's measure. All right, just a hair over an eighth of an inch. Okay, I just went to the grinder and got a nice fresh edge on this tool. I'm going for finish cuts right now. I've got a fairly consistent wall thickness gradually getting thicker down here. I can't overemphasize the first few of these you do, you have to stop and measure continuously so you don't go through the walls. Okay, a finish cut. finished wall all the way up to this point. Now I'm going to go right to the dead center and start relieving a little bit out of there. Let's find it. There it is. Go left. And I'll match up the curve. I'm going to move the tool very slow. Finish up. There we go. And bring it up the hill. That'll eliminate any spirals or tool marks. Okay, that feels good. Let me put a finger in there if I can get it in there. Yeah, that's a good curve. All right. Let's sand it up. Okay, I'm going to start here with a little 180 grit. I'm going to sand in reverse here to start. Fold my paper into thirds. It provides an insulation. I've got to slow my speed up a good 50% in order not to build up heat. Okay, let's go in forward. A little 240. Okay, here's some 320. Let's hit it in reverse. Get a much better sanding job if I can sand in forward and reverse. Forward and reverse. Between grits. 
All right, looks good. We can proceed to 400. Okay, a little 600 to finish off. Maybe do a little hand sanding here if I see any spirals. All right, let's take the bottom off now. Well, this is my vacuum chuck here. The faceplate is made out of a polymer, and you can see I've cut concentric rings here, and basically they fit these little PVC connectors here. So whatever diameter I need, I can just plug in. As long as they run true, I'm okay. For this little holoform here, I need this little connector. And that'll suit me. It'll fit right in across the face there. As long as I'm centered up, I'm going to be good. Now this little gasket area here is a little plumber's gasket. It's hard plastic, or hard rubber, and it's not so hard that it would mar the surface of the wood. But I've just glued that onto that surface there. As long as it's running true, I'm safe. All right, what I've done now is I've measured my bottom. I, I know where I am. I'm right at that smallest diameter, so I've got quite a bit of wood to remove yet. Now, let's plug this in. I've got my center mark there from previous chuckings. Okay, that centers me up on the back, but it doesn't center me up here. Let's bring my tool rest up here as my thumb is my guide. Okay, let's center it up on the top. Leave it a little bit loose so you can make these adjustments. Boy, real close. Let's try that. That looks really good. Let's snug it up. Don't push too tight. Let's do it a little loose. All right, that's running dead true. Now, let's put on our vacuum pump. All right, that's running spot on. Now, let's trim it away. Little series of shear scrapes. about my bottom elevation there. Let's just scrape in the line. There we go. I want a fairly small base here. A little smaller than the opening. That'll give this piece lift. Okay, a little spindle gouge now. Okay. There we go. Now I can move the tailstock away for my final cut. Let's make sure that's on there good and tight. I'm going to be very light with my cut anyway. Okay, a slight indentation here. With a little detail. Okay.
There we go. That's the beauty of a vacuum chuck. It gives me total access to this area. The whole piece now is completely turned. There's no undulations or anything. It's all nice details. I'll just sand this up and we'll call it good. little touch up here okay the details nice and clean I'm happy with that we'll put some finish on it and then we'll talk about it in our wrap-up okay let's get into our burial urn section of our DVD as I mentioned in the introduction, hollow forms lend themselves to be great burial urns as long as we can attach a lid to them. What we need to know more than anything is the size of container we've got to make for whatever's going inside. The general rule is you need a cubic inch per pound of whatever's going inside. Well, if you had a 180 pound man that's cremated, you're going to need 180 cubic inches. Well, that's roughly three quarters of a gallon and I understand half gallons and gallons so I can kind of picture that volume but what I would do instead of going through some elaborate mathematical equation what I would do is oversize the urn now I would start for humans with a piece of wood that's 10 by 10 by 7 and that will give me more than enough volume to fit just about any human now today the piece that I'm going to make is for a friend who's lost a dog and that dog was roughly 25 pounds and this little container is going to be more than enough for that dog now as you can see I've rough turned this piece about a year ago and it's gone quite a bit oval what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it back on the lathe and true up the tenon flip it around true up the exterior hollow out the interior sand it finish it now we're going to make a nice little threaded collar and a threaded lid put a finish on it and it'll be ready for her puppy dog. Um, what you're going to need to know about the drying process of all these things, they have to be well dried and roughed out in order to connect them so they'll stay round over a lifetime. So in this piece for instance I've kept it at about 10 percent of the wall thickness so it's about three quarters of an inch thick and then I let it set aside to dry. And the same thing goes for the two parts that I'm going to put on it, the threaded collar and the threaded lid. Okay, let's go make it happen. Okay, to true up the tenon here, I've just cut a little bit of wood here and just put a taper on it. It's going to fit right around that hole. Put it between centers, true it up, and we'll flip it around. Nice clean tenon there. There we go. That tenon's chewed up and we can put it in the chuck. Okay, you can see it's gone quite a bit out around through the drying process. Let's clean that up. I'm going to take a series of shear scrapes here. Okay, it's round now. Let's clean it up with some shear scrapes, some nice fine cuts. See, that's a nice pretty bit of wood there. Okay, pick up the speed a bit. Refine the shape. Nice soft shoulder here.
nice steep angle on this shear scrape. Gives me a nice clean cut. Slim it up just a bit. Okay, let's take a look at that. Very pretty piece of wood. Looks like all the torn grain's gone. Nice and clean. Now, let's develop the neck here a little bit to accept our threaded insert. What I want to do is slope this down just a bit. I also want to true up the hole here a little bit, get that burning through. There we go. Now I want to cut a little groove there where the collar will sit in. I'll use a little beading chisel here. And just basically knock a little elevation right there. There we go. That'll make sure that the collar sits flush and, and not above where the, the lid will be. For this little form here, I'd like to use this Jordan designed hook tool. It's a perfect size for a small hollow form like this. I'm still going to hollow from the top down. It's a little uneven in there, uh, so I've got to be careful when I start. Again, the tool rest has to be behind the curve. Real easy going in. Smooth it out. smooth it up it's all good now okay to finish up here I've got it nice and smooth right here on the top I'm gonna go to the hybrid hunter tip here and finish up from the inside dead center up to about right there I can use the straight tool on that as long as I don't go around the corner now find dead center this will give me a nice smooth finish Up the hill, very deliberate. All right, let's check that. Now I use the tool at an angle like that, not straight at it, so that way it wouldn't catch. Feels good. I think I've done a good job here. Let's do a little bit of sanding on the inside. Finish this up on the exterior with some good sandpaper. 
Well, as you can see, I finished off my piece completely all the way down to the finish. Now, what I've got to do now is make the collar. And the collar in this case is going to be made out of boxwood. But any wood that threads well and is fairly elastic will do. Now, I don't make it out of blackwood because blackwood has a tendency to be a little brittle if you cut it into a thin cross section. Now, something to consider when you get your threading material. I get my boxwood, for instance, in this branch form. What I do is I put it between centers, I cut it nice and round, and then I part off a bunch of wafers like this, I drill a hole through them, and then I let them set aside for a couple of months and they're ready to go. This will become our little collar right here. So quite a bit in the drying process, I know, but it's well worth it if you want to make these fit over time. Well, let's go ahead and do it. Okay, let's measure our interior diameter, our collar is going to go right into that area. There we go. Now let's chuck up our wafer. Not much of that is going to be inside the vessel, just, oh, maybe a sixteenth of an inch. Okay, there we go. Okay, I moved to a different set of jaws on my truck now, so it'll grip that tenon. Now let's measure another diameter here. That'll work right there. That's the diameter I need. Now, let's cut it. Take half that thickness off. Okay, now we're going to open it up and thread it. Okay, I'm going to open this up to any diameter that I want. It has to go back 90 degrees because our threads are going to work on a 90 degree axis. Softly. All right. Now, that's ninety degrees straight back. In order to start our thread, I have to chamfer that front edge. Now, let's take the chaser. And notice the chaser will strike the wood somewhere in the middle of the chaser, not the lead tooth. A little low. As you can see, it's a very simple operation. There we go, there's our thread. Now the chaser's going back at 90 degrees to the face of the washer. And then I'm just going to develop the thread. That's it. Now I'll put back my chamfer. That'll help it meet the 
lid. Now I'll sand that up and make it look good. Okay, I've got my piece of black wood here that's going to be my lid. I'm going to cut a tenon that's a little larger than this outside diameter and then I'll thread it and thread this over it and that'll be my thread for my lid. that 90 degrees there. I'm going to chamfer the front. That's where I start the thread. Okay, now I'm going to create a stop for the thread to run out. There we go. Slow our speed up just a bit. A little tricky thread to make because I've got to pull it out before I hit that wall. There we go, I've got a thread developed. I'm going to slow it down a bit more. Just go back over it until it gets fully developed and it's 90 degrees. Almost there. Let's test it. All right, good fit. All right, that'll work. Okay, I'm going to turn this around now. I'm going to cut a female threaded jig to screw this into so I can develop the finial. Now I've developed a little jig here that I can just thread my lid to, and now I have total access to my finial. Got to be light with the cuts here. There's our lid with a little wax on it. 
Okay, the lid's finished. Let's see how that fits into our vessel. All right, that looks nice. Well, one burial urn for a puppy. Hope my friend likes it. Let's wrap up with a discussion about what we made today. Now, for our initial hollowing process, I used this ingrain maple piece, and it came out fairly decent. I like the shape as well. I got a fairly consistent wall thickness, and I kept the torn grain and uh, tool marks to a minimum, so I'm fairly happy with that. One thing I didn't mention is that ingrain forms are a little bit more difficult to make than side grain forms. So if it's your first try, maybe go to a side grain form. And certainly you don't use a beautiful timber. Use some practice wood just in case you might have an accident. Well, our little miniature form came out pretty decent as well. I happen to think it's a little heavy just under the center here, but my wife seems to think it's beautiful, and I'm not going to argue with her. Design is very subjective, so you have to go with what you like. Well, our burial urn here came out pretty nice as well, and it's a pretty rewarding project to give to a friend. I happen to think the lid's a little heavy for the base. It would probably go on a larger form a little nicer, but all in all, pretty decent. By watching the DVD today, I hope this helps you make some beautiful forms and some finely crafted ones as well. I'd love to see those if we ever meet on the Turning Trail.